Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I am thrilled today that we are getting to touch on the topic of micromanagement. The sexy part of StarCraft. Oh yeah, this is Let's Learn StarCraft. Oh my god, look at that reality right there. Boom! Reality. Next. Gone. Cut. Don't need it. Live in the digital world at all points in time. I firmly intend to until I literally become a Digimon. I want to talk about micromanagement uh, all day today. Um, focusing on principles of micromanagement that will apply across all three races. And on Thursday, we're going to take specific looks at each of the three, so that way we can zoom in a little bit more on individual units and talk kind of about the texture and the flavor of those uh, specific ones. But there's some important commonalities that exist all the way across micro techniques in Brood War um, that we're going to be emphasizing today. Now, micromanagement is something that I think it's the most visceral thing when people watch StarCraft because people, if you were like me as a kid, you start off, you box all your units, you say go, and you watch. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I love watching armies do their thing. And all of a sudden, a Korean pro does some crazy move allowing his units to get extra value. And it's just mind-blowing. It's just unbelievably crazy and cool to see. How do you do that? What the hell is going on? One of the first things I want to do, uh, starting off with, is talk about what is micro and what are some of the things that we're going to focus on uh, throughout this show. I also realize I'm off-center. Ah, there we go. It feels better. So first of all, micromanagement is the idea. Let me actually move away from this video. Micromanagement is the idea of issuing additional commands to units so that they get way more value, way more bang for their buck than if you had left them alone. It's everything related to that. One of the most important things that we're going to start with is just looking at large army movements. We're just gonna look at some large army movements and just kind of see what is it about the pathfinding in Brood War that allows for so many micro tricks to happen. Just already see how much spreading we have. Already just be in awe and be amazed at all these different shapes that form with one move command. We have stragglers. We have a lot of line stuff happening. You're starting to see some clustering happening at these mineral patches. In many ways, when people initially look at this type of movement, um, I, I gotta be honest, a lot of people don't immediately say, oh, the pathing is bad, something bad is happening. Because in a lot of ways, an intuitive look is happening. With the exception of, say, some stragglers, like some of these guys that are moving backwards, that just looks dumb. But the fact that the units are naturally funneling into a line, moving forward, the fact that units are doing things like getting sometimes caught on some terrain obstacles, they're for the most part getting where they need to go. And when we're trying to get into situations where we are microing in order to get an advantage, one of the most consistent things we're doing is looking at these army shapes and trying to understand where the deficiencies are. And then once, we've, uh, once we're able better to identify what the deficiencies are, how do we then take advantage of it? Uh, one of my favorite things to point out is the idea of a straggler. If we have some Marines, we tell them to move. See this Marine? He's taking a little bit of a longer path. This is just one command, one move command. Um, some of these Marines are starting to move in a line. And let's ask ourselves a question. Where are the weaknesses? Where are the deficiencies in this shape? Right? What do we think of this shape? So first of all, what do we think of this? Whoa, well, I didn't mean to play. What do we think of this shape? What are its strengths and what are its weaknesses? Well, I think an obvious weakness, it's very clustered, very susceptible to storm. If I were looking for a location to plan some sort of AOE attack, like lurkers, like storm, like reavers, I would want it at a clump. You're looking for clumps. Okay. Armies in motion. One thing I want to really highlight for you about the way that movement works in StarCraft compared to StarCraft 2 is that in StarCraft 2, everything is often continuously moving together or apart. Things are very fluid. Shapes in Brood War tend to be quite fixed. And I've actually opened up um, 
Brood War right now. Let's actually get some of that awesome Brood War music in there. Yeah. I have Brood War open right now, and I want to talk about the fact that these shapes tend to be static as things are moving around, right? Like this vertical line of Marines. It stays. And so the fact that it stays means that if you identify that this weakness is here, it's likely going to stay that way unless additional commands are issued. So if I step over to our um, uh, our movement example, this clump of Marines, notice that they're all moving information. This clump is staying relatively static compared to each other. These Marines are staying in the same position relative to each other, but occasionally some weird things fly off like these stragglers. This is a weak point. We might be able to exploit this by picking off with Dragoons or with the Mutalisk. This Marine that's at the bottom. This is a straggler that we might be able to pick off. But as I'm looking at this shape, what, what are some other deficiencies that we are identifying in this? What are some other things that we might argue aren't going correct? Well, I shouldn't say aren't going correct, but maybe are some problems that this Terran player might have. Well, since these units are in a line, this front is vulnerable to getting picked off, kind of in the similar vein that this Marine is vulnerable to getting picked off. These back two Marines are vulnerable to getting picked off, kind of in the same way that this one Marine is vulnerable to getting picked off. What about the sides of this shape? Well, as we're gonna see in a little bit, melee units or units that are looking for surrounds are often very excited by seeing wide angles like this. Lots of surface area there, lots of good ways to puncture in there. But these are Marines. So Marines are often very happy to have units approach them if they're in small enough numbers along a wall. We're often very, very happy to have this wall of Marines. Everyone gets started firing at once. And I'd also like to highlight something. This bulk of Marines at the bottom, it's gonna go down and then left. The straggler is still doing something intuitive. It's going left, then down. So see how it's going left first, and now it's going down? These other Marines are going down, and in a moment they're going to go left. So by and large, they are still approximately going into the same location in the same formation. They might take slightly different paths. And these are not like crazy, what, what is a stupid pathfinding? It's on a grid. So going left and down is the same speed as going down than left. How is it gonna choose? Just by being barely different in terms of an angle. So especially when units are moving over long distances or there's a lot of chaos that's created, you can wind up finding quite a lot of stragglers, quite a lot of uh, deficiencies in shapes. Similarly, here is a group of zealots that I'm going to I'm sure, turn back to normal speed. This group of zealots, I'm just going to issue some move commands over here. Notice that there's these pathing obstacles. So we see that these zealots are sort of moving apart. They're moving around these. And this is a very intuitive type of movement. But still one that we might freeze in this frame and ask ourselves the question, where are the exploitable areas? These are areas vulnerable to pickoffs. Areas like this, vulnerable to pickoffs. Areas like this, more vulnerable to storms. And there's a consistent thing that we've been seeing across all of these which is that units that are in motion spread out, units that are still cluster together. This is just true no matter what the unit is. Here's me running StarCraft Live right now. Having clumps of units like this are very, very important for maximizing damage. If I have a clump of units like this, almost all of them are firing at the same time. You get the same style of efficiency that you might get in StarCraft II. But the instant I issue move commands, just by virtue of encountering terrain, after not that far of a distance, things tend to spread out. In other words, armies in motion are always slightly weaker than armies that are standing still. So as we're going through all of these micro videos, I want you to start training your eye to see the deficiencies in shapes, 
to start trying to track. My cat is crying like she's going to die. She just wants to go out in the hallway. And you know what? She's grounded. She doesn't get to. In all of these, this is one of the specific tools that we're going to be trying to think about and exploit a lot. Another important thing about um, the way that pathing works in StarCraft. I have this one zealot issuing an attack command onto another zealot. Notice that the one that is on the run is able to endlessly avoid any issues. Like, I'm even getting close. I'm even trying to dart in. Look at me. I'm darting close to this zealot. It even stops and halts sometimes. If we slow this down a little bit and ask what the heck's going on, it's a pretty simple summary. This zealot is going to where my controlled zealot was a few frames ago. And because there's that lag time, see it's now going to here, it gets there, oh it's now going to here. Because there's that lag time, you can do very exploitative moves when you're moving away from units simply by glitching the AI. And now what you might say is, well, what if I'm the following zealot? Couldn't I issue additional commands so that this doesn't happen? And the answer is yes. We'll even see a video of it later on. But again, you're having to issue those additional commands in order to overcome that. Same thing exists with air, where um, notice that if I move up, it looks like the Scourge is like trying to spline towards the Mutalisks. But if I often make sharp angle movements, this Scourge never quite gets to the Mutalisk. It gets close, and I do a sharp angle change. Uh-oh. Try to do a sharp angle change. No. Uh. Actually, that was pretty good. I'm amazed I managed to get away from that. If you do these nice big rounded curves or do some sharp angle changes, you can, you can throw off flyers for quite a while until you invariably mess up like I did. <laughs> so these types of follow uh, behaviors and these types of pathing behaviors come up a lot. Um, and so now we can begin to talk about some techniques in order to counteract this. Here's one. Often in weird pathing situations, I've shown examples like this a lot, anytime there's weird uh, obstacles such as terrain or other units, sometimes you get stragglers that really go insane. They really go nuts. And um, there's, there's some blogs that have talked about what's happening. Basically, when they were trying to ship StarCraft 2, oh, excuse me, when they were trying to ship StarCraft, they were really close to shipping for like six months. They were two weeks away from shipping for six months. And so... What would happen when they were issuing pathfinding commands and a clump like this would happen? Well, some of the zealots are receiving commands to wait, but sometimes you have a bunch of zealots waiting and no one's moving, so no new paths open up. And that's really bad if units are told to move somewhere and then they just give up at some point. That feels horrible for a player. So what some of the zealots are receiving is random different move commands to just move them away from each other. And then once they get to those waypoints, they retry again. So this is what's happening to, if we slow it down, what's happening to this zealot, watch this one right here. This guy, he was getting stuck, so he just, zhoop, he's just gonna go far away. And then once he gets, he's gonna get to seemingly a random location. And then he's going to be like, all right, cool, let's try to get home again. So a really simple way to fix these problems with extra attention, with extra micro, is simply to issue lots of move commands. I'm clicking not super fast, just click, 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 click. And notice all the zealots just arrive there seamlessly. If we slow it down and actually look, what's happening is that some of these zealots are beginning to get hitched. Some of these zealots are beginning to tweak out. You can actually see these ones in the back occasionally, like this one is facing down. But when I issue a new move command, it erases that weird, funky, problem-fixing waypoint. 
and just moves forward. So these are some specific ways to escape some of the problems that we saw in these large army situations where, um, excuse me, this one. We can avoid some of these weird snarls that will ha that will happen by, oh, we have stragglers going this way. Well, if you just issued another move command, these stragglers would immediately reroute themselves forward. This little bump down here by the minerals, if you bump and you start to get a traffic jam here, you can just issue more move commands and they'll push their way through. So we've talked about some of the, the, the framing. A lot of micro has to do with the way that pathing works, with the way that some of the AI functions, because we're really trying to exploit the AI and exploit a lot of player tendencies um, that try to get around this in order to maximize value. So let's look at one of the most basic things. Let's talk about ranged unit micro. I'm going to talk about ranged unit micro, and this, this pretty much applies to all the ranged units in the game. For the most part, I just want to stress right now that stutter stepping does not really work for most units. Actually, not most units, a, a good chunk of units. Let's watch these Marines against these Zealots. And let's try to identify what the heck's going on. So, how do you micro ranged versus melee? This looks okay. I'm actually going to lose this Marine. This Zealot is not receiving any extra inputs. He's just sort of autopiloting his way. Barely won that with kiting. There's an important thing to see slowed down, which is if you try to do stutter stepping as fast as you can, notice I'm not actually able to move very much distance. And if we slow the game down and look at what's actually happening, it's that the Marine ha takes a long time to do what's called a wind down or a backswing, which is what shoots and then it puts its gun away. That putting of the gun away takes a lot of time. I'm actually going to rewind that so we can see that one more time. So the biggest thing that um, will actually hurt you with a unit like the Marine is that wind down time after it's it goes wind up shoot wind down um, and so if you just look at the little animation on its gun this is where you'll feel the delay and the seeming sluggishness of this unit is that if you issue the command it needs to finish its backswing animation before it can move again and it's even more pronounced with stim look at how fast it attacks I'm trying to stutter step. I, I can't even really move very much. And if I slow it down again and look at stim with marines, I'm literally in slow motion trying to stutter step. Anytime I'm trying to stutter step with a unit that has a sufficiently fast attack rate, what winds up happening is that I just don't deal damage <laughs> while my units are moving. And this is one of the first come to the face screen sort of moments that we're gonna have here. One of the most important things to successful micro in Brood War is leaving your units alone. Not doing massive boxing and having everything moving every which way, having most things sitting still and attacking. If you try to issue a lot of commands and shoot, move, shoot, move, shoot, move, you're minimizing the amount of damage that that unit can do, and it won't really be very successful. This is even true for units like Hydralisk, where I can technically shoot and move a little bit, but notice that when I just let it attack, it's shooting slightly faster. So all my fancy movement is really hard to get any extra gain out of. Now, I have two Hydralisks here because I can imagine someone saying, well, it's not that much of a loss of damage. So maybe stutter stepping 
with hydralisks is good. Well, you immediately hit this huge control problem when you are um, getting to two control groups or something like that. Where, look at me trying to go 1A, 2A here. 1A, 2A. I'm losing lots and lots of damage just trying to one one move, two move, one A click, two A click. One move, two move, one A click, two A click. Physically very difficult in order to um, in order to do that. So I want you to just hear one more reason why I don't want you to do that, that much stutter stepping, which is that in StarCraft, turning around takes time for your unit. Notice when I tell this Hydralisk to move to the left, it stops and it swivels. It even swivels when you're doing 90 degree angle movements. And so if I am shooting you, turning around, moving, turning back around, shooting, turning around, moving, turning back around, shooting, even with things like the Marine, this is part of why I don't actually have the ability to move very far. Um, and get any value out of it. And so the, the shape that I want you to recognize and see is the big, awesome shape for ranged units uh, when you're in a fight is triangles. It is surrounding the melee units. If this zealot tries to move towards one of these marines, this marine moves away from the triangle or tangent. And therefore, this zealot, by moving towards one of these marines, is moving away from the other two. So let's take a look at this in action. So rather than stutter stepping, which as we saw, led to me barely staying alive, I'm going to pull back into this triangle. And now as the zealot moves towards one of these, it's moving away from the other two. And I'm just keeping everything in a roughly triangular shape. And look at this. I only took two hits that entire time. Only two hits. How does this extend as we increase the size? Well, let's take a look at these three zealots versus these 12 marines. The marines are just going to win this fight. Is me just sitting there. It looks like two marines are dead. Three. Yeah, three marines died. And this is where I accidentally record a little bit of extra time here. So, 12 Marines versus 3 Zealots. Three of these Marines died, and one of them took a little bit of damage. If you want to try to do uh, some micro in this spot, try to, again, start spreading your units out so that you have those slower zealots in the middle and you're surrounding it. It's that triangular formation. So here I have my units in a little bit of a more awkward clump. Pull some of these guys away. And so here we actually lost fewer marines total. Things went a little bit better because we were pulling injured ones to the back. And if we look, in closer detail, let's look at a few things. First of all, and I can't stress this enough, I am not selecting that many units at once. If you recall, in the no micro situation where we just lost three Marines, I wasn't doing anything. All right, that's our benchmark for success. So first, I pull back one. Now I'm selecting these four and I am going to pull these down. Why? Because I'm starting to, again, form that triangular shape. Try to get a surround. So if it's going to any boundary of the surround, it's moving away from the majority of my units. See, I move down like this. I get a little caught. These units, I'm retreating and trying to pull these zealots more to an internal area. I'm doing some small selections at once. I select this one. That was incorrect. I should have selected this one. But great. Let me let me show going a little too over eager on micro and showing what the effect of that can be. So here I have some Marines here. Some are injured. 
But what's going to happen is a lot of people will see this and they'll go, oh my gosh, and they'll box almost all the Marines that are vaguely nearby. <laughs> this is the mistake that people make for years and never realize what they're doing wrong with micro. They're over-selecting units. Notice in this very first boxing, this is a very natural thing to happen. You see this and you go, oh no! Zealots are going to attack my Marine and box and pull back. But here, by boxing a lot of Marines, okay, first step, we box, we try to retreat, and then we box another three, and notice that for a brief moment in time, this was the only Marine that was sitting there and shooting. And then you can wind up with little errors like this, where you've pulled units back so much that a lot of them are not firing, and then you're trying to over micro and and suddenly i'm actually a little worse off than i was in the no micro situation because i was over microing and over spreading and overly trying to push towards this shape in its absolute literal sense what i want to show are some more simple techniques for dealing with this one is removing as small a column as possible. So here, I have sort of a flat shape of Marines advancing forwards. And so if Zealots wind up approaching this, I, it's very easy for me to retreat a Marine as long as there's no Marines behind it. So this is, again, that the, those shape analyses we were talking about. This is a very flat shape here. So here, I just grab that whole column of units and slide it on back grab this whole column of units, and I'm not gonna slide it quite back. I'm gonna go a little bit more down with my angle, because again, that triangle's the core shape that I wanna remember. Um, there's another technique, I don't know if there's a name for it, but I call it slicing, which is where, okay, so my Marines, they were sort of moving as a flat wall here, they're, they're moving as a point. So you'll notice that right now, it's very difficult for me to grab a column and pull it back because each of these Marines has many Marines behind it. So what you do is you make a very thin box at the front of the shape and you pull it down. And then likewise, you make another slice and you pull it up. Notice how we're returning to this idea of having the enemy units at the center with us at a spread around. So these are some really essential, really core concepts that will apply across lots of different actions, or excuse me, interactions. I am showing Marine versus Zealot here, but you could wind up in this situation. Let me actually go to this one. I'm showing Marines versus Zealots here. This could be Hydralisks versus Zealots. This could be even something like Hydralisks versus Dragoons. And you are noticing that the front of your shape is receiving damage. And you need to answer the question, how do I move those damaged Hydras back? Perhaps slicing the front and pulling it back is the correct decision. Perhaps if you have more of a bar shape, a flat uh, approach, Maybe just pulling small columns back, just stepping back and stepping back into the fight. Some units in the game have the ability to stutter step. Some of the units in the game can stutter step. For instance, watch the Dragoon stutter step. A Dragoon has a sufficiently long amount of time between when it fires and reloads that you can move without really losing almost any time in terms of its firing. It's a little harder to do it when you actually have to manually A-click because you're shooting your allied unit. And for some of the units in the game, making sure that you have good stutter stepping is really, really important. So in this video, I have one Dragoon up against six Marines. This Dragoon does have range. And here, I'm going to stutter step, and I want to be very explicit about something that I'm doing in this video. 
I am trying to shoot on cooldown. So notice that I shoot, retreat, retreat, a little bit, shoot, shoot, shoot. Let's look at how much damage I'm taking, right? I'm already down to, I've already lost almost all my shields. But I'm really trying to shoot as often as humanly possible. Getting a lot of damage down, but I'm also taking a good amount of damage. I can't stress enough that as you watch this video, notice how long this unit stays still. It's not as long as the Marine does. It doesn't have as long as a wind down as the Marine, but there's this, you'll see this opening charge up from the Stalker as it opens up. Look, see, here it is. It's opening up. That's a full open up and then fire animation. And right as the little ball leaves, that's when I can move it. So it opens up, shoots, and now it can move again. I'd say a good 30 to 40% of the time, the stalker is standing absolutely still. This is how units behave. Uh, or by and large, the units in Brood War behave. They, they must be still in order to be shooting. And for that reason, I want to show a slightly better, well, I, I don't want to call this better, I want to show an alternative idea that's just as important as learning to fire on cooldown. And that's the following. Since I was staying still, like maybe 40% of the time, it's okay for me to not fire on cooldown and instead to try to stay out of range. These Dragoons have a range of 7, these Marines have a range of 5. Or I think it's 6 and 4. It's a difference of 2. I actually don't know what the ranges are because they're not listed anywhere in the game. <laughs> but I know that they have a differential of 2. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm actually going to um, be, as I'm pulling back, I'm trying to hit hold position as just barely out, as far out of range as I can. I whiff a few shots there. But you'll notice I'm receiving way less damage. By the end of this, I only received 30 damage. I did whiff a few shots, but this is me trying to be careful and avoid damage. So I took almost all of it there. I don't think I even get hit. No, I totally get hit there. Now, a brief word of warning. If in this um, in this video, what I am doing, this will actually take some brood war to show. All right, we got some brood war going. I want to talk a little bit right now about the different commands in the game. Move, stop, attack, patrol, and hold position, and what makes them different from each other. So, um, attack moving, almost always the first thing that uh, hitting the attack command will do to a unit is it will say, try to find if there's someone around you to attack, and then start moving, right? That's what it's doing. It's looking for a target nearby. And often, if there is... A a ability for my marine to shoot right here. This is the boundary of the marine range. My marine will often not begin firing immediately as this enemy unit begins to move in. My marine will take a while to actually acquire the target and then begin shooting. It's kind of related back to what we saw in this video with the follow behavior. Remember in the follow ground, you saw that this unit was only updating every few frames with new places to follow? Let me say that better. This zealot was not receiving an update every frame to track this zealot. It was like every few frames it would check. So it's like, oh, let's do a check, 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 check check. You can actually see it as that zealot turns. It's not all the time that it's doing that check. And so similarly, if it's going target acquisition check, wait a little bit, wait a little bit, check, wait a little bit, wait a little bit, check. If this marine 
needs to be on these white shells in order to be in range of this other Marine. Notice that, check for target, wait a little bit, wait a little bit. Check for target, oh, nothing's in range, wait a little bit, wait a little bit. Check for target, oh, this is in range, okay, yeah, shoot it. This means that if you just have units lying around, they will often not immediately begin attacking. And so when I'm doing this stutter step, uh, let's see, good stutter versus Marines, is this it? Yeah. When I'm doing the stutter step, I want you to notice an important command that I'm issuing, which is I hit hold position. And whenever a unit is set to hold position, it immediately checks for targets within its range. And so if I'm hitting hold position and this Dragoon is within range of these Marines, it's going to shoot at one. But, remember what I was just talking about with target acquisition ranges, right? If I hit hold position and I'm outside of the range, look, I hit hold position and these Marines get close enough to shoot me before my Dragoon acquires them as a target because the Brood War engine just does not look for targets that often when units are idle. So this is, this, is, this is a really subtle but really important thing. I'm just going to repeat what I said again because it's kind of weird. I give my Dragoon the hold position range. Engine checks. Is there anything nearby? No. There's nothing within range. So I don't need to check for targets for a little bit. A little bit passes. And notice that it does shoot. It does find that Marine. But the Marine is also within range of the Dragoon. Again, I hit hold position here. This is outside of the Dragoon range. The Dragoon says, great, no targets. And now it's an idle Dragoon. And idle units take a long time to acquire targets. So, what is the micro skill that you need to be good at? You need to be very good at knowing when you are within range of a unit, when you hit hold position or when you hit attack, in order to maximize that range. So, all right. Some general tidbits about these things. Move commands obviously have nothing to do with targeting. That just moves the units and turns off any sort of targeter to find an enemy to shoot at. The stop command is like the hold position. You'll immediately stop and check for a target, but you're allowed to move. Hold position, you'll immediately stop and check for a target, and you're not allowed to move. Attack is checking and moving. The patrol one is very interesting. I have my control bound to Q because I'm an unbelievable newbie. But patrol issues a move command and immediately begins looking for targets kind of at the same time. And through a lot of research, people discovered that the slowest command in terms of registering in the engine was attack. And then Move and stop, I think, are really close in terms of speed, but then hold position is the second fastest, and patrol is the fastest. So again, attack is, for all intents and purposes, attack is the slowest, hold position is in the middle, and patrol is the speediest. So if we come back to this Dragoon video, I'm going to ask you the question. Why am I issuing a hold position command and not an attack command. Well, for one, hold position is faster than attack. Great. Why am I not issuing a patrol command? Well, technically it's faster, but I don't want my Dragoon to take any steps closer. I do not want it to take steps closer. That would be bad. So that's why I'm issuing the hold position command. Almost always in StarCraft, you're going to be using the attack command for general things. You're going to use hold position for some very specific units. Again, emphasis on Thursday. And patrol you're going to be using for hovering units. Okay, so I want to briefly recap where we are at before we go on to hovering units. So we've talked a little bit about looking at shapes, identifying shapes and the weaknesses within them to be able to exploit them. 
we talked about some of the interesting pathing stuff that happens in uh, Brood War. We've talked now about the idea of general micro ranged versus melee, the importance of not moving your damn units. And we just got done talking about stutter stepping. I want to talk now about hovering units. Hovering is a tag that's applied to some units in Brood War where they have a slow acceleration and deceleration with their movements. So for instance, Marines, it's just not moving or it's moving at maximum speed. It takes some time to turn, but cool. Tanks, same way. I click, it's moving at max speed. It does its little turns. Cool. Vultures, on the other hand, notice that when I click, it speeds up and it slows down. It has an acceleration and a deceleration. Workers are also units that have this. So here is an SCV. You see it decelerate and accelerate to and from its targets. Interestingly enough, Archons are also considered hovering units. You'll notice that it speeds up and slow. You can almost always tell when a unit hovers by when it turns, how it kind of has this little bend to it. SCVs will have this too. And of course, the most notable of all is flying units have acceleration and deceleration to them. So these are what are called hover units. Why does this matter? Well, let's look at some tricks to micro hover units super effectively. So here is super fast vulture versus super slow zealot. Obviously the zealot is never gonna get to me. Let's look at some of the commands I'm hitting here. If I try to issue an attack move command where I'm attack moving just a click right on the ground you'll see that my vulture slows down and shoots this is suboptimal because it has acceleration and deceleration to it um, you know I might try stop or hold position in order to do better like hey the dragoon worked well with hold position maybe stop well doesn't actually work. I think up here now is where I actually hit hold position. Yeah, here's hold position again. Same sort of hovering issue. Doesn't quite work. And I wanted to just add some brief nuance to that. If my vulture is facing the unit, it can shoot without losing its momentum. So I'm actually A clicking right on it. And so what you might think is the best thing to do is if you are facing away from a unit, click towards it, A click, and then move away. Could there possibly be a button that does something similar to moving and attacking at the same time? Yes, the patrol button. So watch how much easier it is for me to do this with the patrol button. I think I was issuing some attack commands. It's really, really smooth. To hit the patrol button when we're doing it. This is the best example of this, which is when you're hitting the patrol, you're not just hitting patrol anywhere, you're hitting it at an angle. Because you want the vulture to turn slightly in this angle and then shoot. You don't want it to turn all the way around and drive itself into the zealot. You want it to just turn a little bit. So notice that if, if you kind of view the track that I'm moving on as a circle, you want to hit patrol kind of towards the center of the circle. So, see how if I'm clicking in there, I, I kind of move towards. But if I if I click more towards the center, like this, it's hardly any turn at all. Like that. Like that. Hitting Q towards the center. Or patrol, whatever your button is, towards the center leads to the best possible result. And I want to stress some of the stuff that I did here at the start of this. If you are clicking towards the unit, I can't do this fast enough. Yeah, you can A click towards the unit, but you're moving so far towards it. I'm gonna hit patrol in a second here. Come on. Oh yeah, that was me showing another attack move. But again, I'm closing the distance between me and the Zealot, which I don't want. 
the more I try to hit Q and click towards the zealot, the more I'll move towards it. So I just want to move at wide angles and hit Q click at wide angles. See this? These clicks, these last few clicks, if you click here, this isn't quite steep enough because the vulture moves this way and its angle of being able to acquire a target is kind of like this. So if I'm clicking kind of like perpendicular to where it's chasing me, it doesn't work. It's not quite enough. You need to click in a little bit like that. In a little bit towards, again, the center of the circle. These next few shots are very clean. And you can issue these commands as fast as your little little heart can handle. No Alright, awesome. Alright, what is this next video? Ah, okay. So we've just taken a look at some hovering units and understood a little bit about that. I want to return back to this uh, zealot versus marine situation and ask ourselves some questions. Hey, what, what are the micro tricks on the zealot side? Well, we already know that on the Terran side, on the ranged unit side, or just generally if you have a big ranged army against another army, getting being around it is really good. This is a desirable shape. And so if I am going to be this zealot, I can estimate where he is going to be microing and take advantage of that. Okay, look at this pause frame right here. My zealot is headed right towards this marine. What do you think our opponent's going to do? I strongly suppose that he's going to take this marine and pull it this way. And so I intend on getting close to this and immediately cutting up to this marine. Okay. Which direction is this marine likely going to go in? One thing that's actually kind of nice here is that there's a tree, so if it goes this way or this way, uh, I can sandwich it. And that's exactly what I try to do. Look at this click that I have here. Okay, I'm estimating he's going to try to run this one, so I am going to try to pinch it off. And I actually successfully do. I successfully block that. It's a little bit hard to see because it happens very quickly, but thank God for the ability to pause. So again, I see this. I'm predicting he's going to move this one, so I'm already headed up to this way. And then I think he's going to move here, so I move my zealot to this side. His marine was issued a command up here, but I blocked it with my zealot, so his marine's actually going to curl on the inside. Uh-oh. So I just picked that one off right away, so I'm going to start whacking at this one. What is the next thing that I would expect? Well, he's probably going to pull this one away but probably not this way i'm guessing he's going to be moving it closer to his other marine and that's going to allow me to stay with him turns out that was a correct prediction and i just run after any old marine that i can get at this point because he's running low and then this tree almost ruins my whole day and this is what the dance of micro looks like when you start to have both sides of the melee versus the range or the short range versus the long range where you know i'm gonna go in on this guy and i'm gonna try to i could have gotten another hit on that other one but i'm already trying to run past this marine and my opponent's doing a really good job so i try to cut in towards this marine but he predicts that perfectly and just kills me now this wasn't this, this guy received two hits, two hits, and one hit, so I still got five hits in. Notice that this is still significantly better than the um, than this video that I showed. This is the Zealot not doing any micromanagement at all. But this is, this is kind of what I find so fun about the micro battles in Brood War. It's not super freaking complicated in a lot of ways. It's some pretty basic stuff going on enough for you to track when you've just had, you know, 50, 100 games of practice to where you can start to actually have these little dances that wind up happening. Here's another video of me winning with the Zealot against the Marine, and I'm purely putting this in here because I am a monument to the vanity of content creators. He See, he, he over-micros and messes up and doesn't get that other Marine at the bottom participating. Do I actually win this one? 
Yeah, I, that was that was. This is less me winning and more my my buddy messing up. Never mind. I'm I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. She saw this one. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I've I've taken a look at a little bit of these tricks for the melee units. Uh, I want to show a few essential melee movements, just like the triangle with ranged or spreading out uh, as ranged. This is this is so basic, critical. You gotta understand this. Okay. Here's some zealots. Here's a group of marines. The marines are gonna beat the zealots, but let's look at what happens with the zealots. They get up there, there's some clumping, there's some straggling, and then finally the zealots get up there. This should remind you of something. This should remind you of something. In particular, this moment here, When we see all these deficient shapes, you know what it reminds me of? Well, gosh, it might be because I made this video. This one. The ramps with the zealots heading down them. Issuing one-click command? Not so good. Not so good. Now, if we look at this and we say, okay, I don't want to be hitting this in a line. I don't want to be sending this in. So I can do some better pre-preparation. Certainly, if you watch my large-scale army control video, I talk a lot about setting your zealots up in an arc before you go into the fight. But let's say that we don't want to do that. How can we make our lives better? Same number of zealots, same number of marines. Spam clicking on the other side as though this is a ramp. Spam, 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 spam and wait until I am around. And then A click once. Watch how much better this is. I actually almost won this, which was surprising. So there's, there's two important things that are happening in this. The first is the spam clicking in order to prevent any stragglers. You'll even see some of these zealots. See the zealot? See how he's turning up this way? Nope, straight as an arrow again. That's the first thing. The second thing is waiting until I have moved sufficiently around, until I've sufficiently enveloped, and then I A click. I just want to note something. I didn't make a video for this, but I love to talk about the beauty of the dance that exists in micromanagement. If you are doing this and you're trying to envelop the enemy, but you misjudged and he has too much stuff, then you've really thrown a lot of units away. And I love the fact that judgment is such an important part. Judging all these different shapes and your uh, the different compositions and whether you can get in there. Let's look at this example with a larger clump of marines versus a larger clump of zealots. This could be dragoons versus zerglings or some other such thing. We'll see some other issues arise with um, these zealots coming in. We're going to hit some snarls. Right here is what I call a snarl. It's where units are moving every which way except right where you freaking want them to, right? Getting caught on each other, clumping up. I think I lose this one, like, quite badly. Or maybe I start losing it badly, but then Zealots are, like, the scariest unit in all of StarCraft, so... actually went okay for me. Uh, there is... There are other techniques that will be critical when you have large armies and you're trying to do these micro-decisions to fix those. Yeah, you can still do the one-click, two-click, one-click, two-click, spam, pass, wait till you've enveloped and then execute with the A click. But other things that you can do are you treat these snarls as small boxes, as small box commands, and then try to issue movements around. Grab another box, click, 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 move it around. Why is this important to note? Well, sometimes you'll have an army that's like 70 units. You send all of them in, you don't have enough hands you don't have enough hotkeys. <laughs> you don't have enough hands. <laughs> Some of you are low on hands. Uh, if you just send in tons of waves of units, like if you're Zerg, as I play, you're going to be sending in like 150 Zerglings. No way you can control them all at once. Let's look at some of the ways that you can deal with this. You just start identifying where there's clumps. 
clumps of units are very good for storming. They're very good for reavering. But also, you should identify that clumps are dangers so you can box select and then right click around. And notice how I'm taking this top clump, moving it up, around, enveloping. Continuing to do smaller sub boxings to make sure that I have as strong of a surface area as humanly possible. And this goes better for me. Um, you know, you heard me talk about this with Zerg. Same sort of stuff. So here, I'm just using hot, or, uh, box selecting. I'm not using any hotkeys once this battle begins. And you see me doing tons of reboxing, tons of reboxing to unsnarl. It's not even close. It's coming in again, boxing the top. More clumps are forming at the back. Pull those around. I see clumps forming at the top and bottom. Just gonna grab those, move those around. Easy peasy. So one thing that you heard me talk um, about uh, throughout this entire episode is shapes and identifying weaknesses of shapes. If I have melee units like these Zerglings, how might I engage against these Dragoons? Well, if I go along this point, or excuse me, go along the flat side of a, of a Dragoon wall, I can often have issues because you'll see my Zerglings, that they'll, they'll get stuck trying to move around, and often they don't really surround at all. Often they just go around to one side. So you can see the, the, the snarling, the clumping happening right here or on this bottom side. And so pretty quickly we can just say, yeah, you know, if you're seeing a line, unless you do a lot of pre-spreading, if you're trying to envelop, like, by the way, it's one thing if here are Dragoons and I have a small amount of Zerglings, if I have a very small amount of Zerglings, oh, I want to hit this on the side because I'm going to immediately hit the surface area. But if I start to have large amounts of Zerglings that I want to do surrounds with, I want to come in on the point. Because notice how my dudes naturally surround in a, in a much more straightforward manner. That just, that just looks prettier. Look at that. Look at that beautiful surface area for all the links. So if you have lots of units and you're going for surrounds, hitting on points is really good. I think I just show myself killing some Dragoons. I mean, you know I'm going to kill them, but, you know. Yep. Little issue like that. Easily resolved with just a quick box select. Great. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about melee, we've talked a little bit about range, we've talked about um, some declumping techniques, some slicing microing techniques. I want to talk about surrounds. You just saw me talk about zerglings surrounding dragoons. This can exist uh, with all sorts of different units. Vultures trying to surround dragoons and plant mines, zerglings trying to surround dragoons to kill it off, zealots trying to surround tank vulture, anything like this. Getting around to get surface area happens all the time. And by the way, just to make sure I'm super clear on that, um, this is an example of trying to go for surrounds. Like zealots trying to click past enemy units. It could be marines. More often it's like tanks. The zealots are just right-clicking past the tanks until it has a good surface area, and then boom, clumping in. Here's an example of how scary surrounds can be. And we're going to ask the question, okay, this is a common situation that comes up in micro. One player trying to surround another. I'm just going to come up. I'm going to plant a whole bunch of mines around here. There's not much he can do. <laughs> that last mine, it was so good. This was the first attempt at recording this too. I was like, wah! That is such a good mine hit, man. That is awesome. So how do you prevent this from happening? How do you deal with it? Very important technique. You just run into the attempt to surround. Often people try to run away, try to stutter step, something like that. Because of the way that pathing works in Brood War, 
units are very solid surfaces to run up against. It's very hard to slip through them. In StarCraft 2, it's a piece of cake to slip through units. Um, but here, no I'm going to take some vultures. I'm going to try to go for a surround. And the dragoons just block. And then they attack. And then I'm, my surround's canceled. Ugh. And maybe I try to go for another surround or something. I don't remember what happened in this video. Did I try to go in again? Oh yeah, I tried to go in again. Alright, let me try to surround again. And he just blocks. Look at that. Beautiful. And now, the Dragoons have plenty of room with which to retreat. That's pretty amazing. This is what I love about Micro in Brood War is... Yeah, I have two more Vultures in this circumstance. But it's not the fact that I have 12 Vultures. It's the fact that I got the surround with the Mines that led to... This thing of total beauty. Look, here it comes. These two mines. Oh, God. That was gorgeous. Versus this surround blocking where... I don't even think I dealt much damage to any of the Dragoons. Certainly no hull damage. You didn't lose any. I'm losing vultures by the handful. Just great job. Just great, great, great job. So, another thing that... I bring up this blocking first because stutter stepping is not nearly as effective as you might imagine. Here's here's my vultures trying to move in. If the dragoons just try to shoot and retreat, he messed up a little bit there on the retreat, but that's okay. He's still going to be stutter stepping. If I get almost anything down, If he starts making some mistakes, it's actually not that difficult for me to just continue to plant mines. And so one of the funniest things is that, again, due to pathing, full-scale retreat is in many ways better than stutter stepping. Look at this. I try to surround, and the dragoons just run. I'm trying to click past. I'm trying to plant stuff. The dragoons, they're just, they're just running, man. I mean, I get a few mines off. But full-scale retreat? Dude, you should always be happy to do full-scale retreat. Okay, one of the last topics that I want to focus on is target firing. Target firing. One of the most basic, critical things to do. Here I have eight Dragoons versus seven tanks. Because these tanks are not sieged, they are not the most horrifying thing in the entire world. If I just 1A through here, I think I barely survive with, like, three tanks. I'm just letting the Dragoons shoot whatever they so desire. Same with my buddy. He actually probably could have... He actually could have killed that Dragoon. So, like, barely three Dragoons. Um, if I move in with eight and start target firing, there's a few things I want to note. First of all, it goes better... Second of all, eight Dragoons, one shot a tank. So here we go. One, two. Sometimes Dragoons glitch and don't fire, which you got the chance to see there. And here we have three Dragoons that live. Two really solidly, one pretty healthy. Was a little bit better. One of the things about target firing is that this is this is the absolute most basic. Everybody shoot one thing, right? And this is something good to do. But a lot of target firing is about understanding the numbers behind it and being able to make decisions based on that. So for instance, here I have four Dragoons. Four Dragoons take one, two, three volleys. I'm going to bring another Dragoon in. Five Dragoons take one, two volleys. Whoa, there was something critical happening between four and five. And six Dragoons take one, two volleys. I accidentally didn't have this guy fire in the first uh, shot, but just believe me when I say it takes two volleys from six. So five and six Dragoons are basically the same. What's that critical volley count for tanks? Well, I told you it's eight, but here's some other useful learning. Two shots from four will also do it. And you know what's also not so bad? 
three shots from three. And I want you to think about it. Four shots from four is eight shots. Three shots from three is nine total shots. You lose the tiniest bit of efficiency having three target fire versus having four target fire. So let's watch the way that I do this when I have eight using this understanding. So I'm gonna move forward. And I'm going to first shoot all at one shoot all at another but now that i've lost one which i was intending on i'm gonna have four shoot one three shoot another so i have three here three here i've lost a little bit of efficiency and also some of these shots missed because the tank was under a tree and now i'm down to four again so i know i can two shot tanks and I'm even moving in there a little bit more aggressively. And I now barely have four Dragoons, barely have four. Now again, I wanna, I wanna highlight how frustrating this is. See, see the shots that miss? If you're underneath a tree, 50% of the shots miss, so it kind of messed up the experiment a little bit. Trees are cover? Yeah, yeah, trees, trees are the same as high ground uh, in terms of cover. And so with these, um, with these tanks, by understanding target firing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a kind of outside of battle calculation where I'm going to say, ah, some very useful numbers for me with Dragoons against tanks are eight tank shots kill a tank, and then groups of four shooting tanks and groups of three shooting tanks. Perfect. What's another math I might do? Oh, five Dragoons to two-shot another Dragoon. Great. Very useful little tidbit of knowledge. All right. Let's finish this video sequence with one of my favorite uh, topics of discussion, magic boxing. So we've looked at how large masses of units move around. Knowing how small masses of units move are very, very, very important because in large scale fights, we can use this understanding to our advantage. So for instance, here I have three High Templar in a triangular formation. If I move, they stay in triangular formation. If I set them up as a vertical line, you see that, yeah, they move as a vertical line. There's sometimes some little teensy variations that happen in there, but 90% stay in formation. How big of a formation can we do? Actually pretty big. Pretty large that it, it keeps formation. And again, some, some weird little detours might happen, but for the most part, keeping formation. What happens if we keep spreading it out and send them somewhere? Eventually, we break the size of what's called the magic box. The magic box is what defines formation. And so it's about, it's about this high and maybe a little wider than this. I mean, maybe this is like two-thirds as wide. I can actually just show you in Brood War. It's, it's, about, it's about that big. That's about the magic box size. Let's actually see if I'm correct. So I'm going to say it's about that big. Let me put the Marines at the points of where I believe it to be. That looks about right. So if I take these and I... Yeah. Yeah, see, they, they, they stay in formation, whereas if I extend this a little farther, they will all cluster up at the point. So, there's a couple important things that emerge as a result of this. Uh, you hear me talk about this all the time. My favorite thing to talk about is magic boxing with flyers, most notably the mutilisks. Mutalisks, if they move around like this, we don't like that. We want them to be clustered up. It's way easier to do cool micro with flyers. But if I select a faraway unit, the game says, oh, 
These are close, but this overlord is outside of the magic box. Therefore, we want everyone to cluster at wherever you're clicking. So there is the clicking upon the ground. Look at how clustered they are. Other races can do this too. Here I have some wraiths. They're moving around in formation. Do -do 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 -do. But if you do something like trap an SCV behind some supply depots, notice that that SCV cannot get out. Very useful in order to get those wraiths to cluster up. And when they're clustered, you can do really nice things like hit and run. Shoot. 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 Yeah. Um, the other far less talked about but just as important thing is that magic boxing works for abilities. If I have these three High Templar and I storm somewhere, it's not showing up one of the storms due to vision, but... If I make like a triangle of High Templar and storm somewhere, the storms are in the same formation as the High Templar. Notice that when I storm here, again, the storms are in the same formation as the High Templar. But if I spread those High Templar out enough, and then I click on one location, it storms at the point. The area where this most frequently comes up is storm and mines. So if I, if I select 12 spread out vultures and click somewhere, they're all trying to place a mine at that one location. Whereas if I just select, say, three and say plant mines, now all three plant mines because they're planting in formation. And so this is important if I want to plant lots of mines very quickly. It's best for me to make a small box press I, make a small box, press I, make lots of small boxes, selecting small amounts of vultures and planting lots of mines rapidly. I'll even show how this winds up hurting a lot of players when they just have a lot of vultures. And, you know, I'll see them do things like this where they'll try to plant a lot of mines, and then sometimes this will happen, but they won't know why. They'll just feel like vultures are are shitty, but, you know. If you're doing small movements like this, I mean, you can get so many mines down so fast. So now I've mined up this whole area. Yeah. Um. And so... There's only uh, two more things that I have left, and it's 620, so this is a little shorter than the going all the way to 7, but, you know, no big deal. Uh, I want to stress that on Friday, or on, excuse me, on Thursday, we're going to be doing a look at a lot of Zerg units, a look at a lot of Terran units, and a look at a lot of Protoss units. We're going to go each race at a time. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the idea of microing dropships and how those work. And I want to talk a little bit about spellcasters and large armies. So let's go ahead and make a whole bunch of ground units down here, and then put in some high templar. Alright, great. First thing to note about things that drop is that they're hovering units. So it's very important to make sure that if you're trying to do some sort of harassment, that you try to keep this dropship moving at all points in time. For example, let's say I wanted to harass this worker line. If I hit the unload button, and I just unload here, notice that it decelerates, stops, and then begins to unload. Not a full stop, but it may as well be. If I unload here... Ugh. Awful. Brutal. But, and wh why is this bad? Because if I'm unloading like this, it's slower to get everything out. And worse, if an enemy unit shows up and starts shooting... Where are you? If an enemy unit shows up and starts shooting, it's slower for me to actually get up and get out of there. So if you're doing drop harass, here's a couple of techniques in order to 
avoid a lot of these issues. First one, you can just click on the units that are here and it will unload at full speed. It's really helpful. Second thing is you can actually hit unload and click on the dropship while it's moving and it will unload while moving. There's the real money trick. So let me actually just make an armory real fast. Do I have infinite build speeds on? Thank goodness. Alright, loading these guys up. This is the super critical dropping stuffs. Alright. If you're moving, hit U and click on the thing and it just unloads while moving. Very, very helpful. Okay, what's... What's a fast way to load up? It is surprisingly obnoxious to try to load up into a dropship. Like, if I click and do this, or if I have any amount of spread outedness here, and I just click the units, and I click get into the dropship, you kind of wind up with some large scale disorganization sometimes. Or units getting stuck. Like, here's a really common one. You, you, you tell the tank to get in here. And it never quite gets there. Really easy way to do the reloading is you select everything at once that you want loaded up. Including the dropship. You right-click on the dropship, and then you individually control the dropship yourself. So let's actually tie all of that stuff together. I want to move in with some sort of dropship harassment. Maybe it's a shuttle with a reaver. Maybe it is an overlord with some hydralisks in there. I'm going to move out this way. I'm going to start unloading. I'm going to keep this moving as much as possible while the harassment's happening. And it's not hard. You just issue one attack command or one move command to this thing, just to make sure it's still moving. And then when I want everything loaded up, I select everything, right click, and then just go back to controlling only the dropship. We'll even be going over more of this on the Thursday. Uh, and the literal last thing that I want to talk about is some micro techniques for when you have a whole lot of Templar in your army. The thing about uh, this is a little bit dipping into large-scale unit control, but I still think it's super pertinent. If I have, like, some High Templar moving around, the worst thing you can ever do is control-click all your Templar and just hit Storm. You really don't want to do that. Because, I mean, I have cheat codes on. <laughs> but, I mean, let's see. Typically, you'll have, like, this much energy will be a little bit more normal where you maybe have one or two storms. And if at any point one of your Templar is a little too far away and you storm here, you screw yourself over. So almost always, players will have their High Templar mixed in with everything. And then when they're issuing a big attack command somewhere, and the battle looks something like this, they'll actually just abandon controlling everything else and individually throw down storms. And that might feel a little weird, but it winds up being so powerful because like you don't need in in other um, RTS games, like Warcraft 3 and Starcraft 2 are the big ones I'm thinking of especially, you kind of are looking for every single unit to kind of get its fair share of the value. You're looking for, you know, for instance, Starcraft 2, you want this Templar to hit the center of the bio, and this Templar to hit a small chunk of the bio, and this Templar to hit this small chunk of the bio. In Brood War, it's a little more like you just need, like, two good storms. So if you have, like, you know, four high Templar, you're, you're individually selecting because you're trying to maximize that value. You're trying to maximize the probability of nailing a storm. It's not about making sure this gets some value, and this gets some value, and this gets some value, and this gets some value. You're just trying to 
throw down one or two good storms in a fight. And the same thing winds up being true with like science vessels and other spellcasters. As long as these guys are not marching out to their death somewhere, you will very often see movement like this. You'll very often see a bioforce with some vessel support. The marines will move out with the vessels. One a click, two a click, one a click. Just moving everything out. You'll very often see a Terran player stop like this and then just grab two and move forward and cast whatever spells they want to cast. Rarely ever do you actually want all your science vessels all together. Like, actively doing stuff. You're just going to be doing little stuff at a time. Let me just research these. And I figure I'll end on everyone's favorite thing. Anyone know what the eraser is? Anyone know what the eraser is? This is this is Thursday material, but this is fun. You know what the eraser is? I hate I hate this name because it's clearly like someone who played Infinite Money Maps, discovered this, and tried to give it a cool nickname, and somehow it stuck. Oh my god! Oh, this is so bad. where you irradiate two science vessels and then you tell them to patrol across a mineral line because irradiate doesn't deal damage to mechanical units but it does deal damage to biological units pretty dirty pretty dirty baby it's nice so, all right let's talk about some shapes this shape. What are the deficiencies of this shape? Let's think about this, right? Because, yeah, even though it's all standing still, in a normal game, you might have it moving across the battlefield like this, and you want to be able to exploit where you see the problems being. So what if, let's get an army in motion. Let's say this is the shape. What do we think the weaknesses are? Well, in this particular shape, I noticed that all the anti-air is on one side. It's on this top side. Not a lot of anti-air down here, so these guys are vulnerable. Uh, these honestly look pretty damn safe. Uh, zealots look pretty good. Everything looks... This is a pretty solid looking shape. Maybe just the anti-air. As armies tend to move more out onto the map. But for something like this, what do we think about this shape? Well, these two guys, you know, assuming that units are mostly here, these guys are pretty safe. I'm a little worried about these guys, though. These are kind of off at a corner. Here we have some weakness to air or weakness to vultures. This could be an opportunity to pick off. Many of you will recognize this shape. All right, what, what is this shape? This is a common Protoss versus Terran shape. The Dragoons at the front to deal with Vultures. The Zealots at the back to move in at any moment. And uh, the Dragoons are protected, or the Zealots are protected by the Dragoons. Where do we think some of the weaknesses are? Well, I can actually move some tanks forward to here because the Zealots aren't anywhere nearby. These shapes tend to be very fluid, uh, as you might imagine, due to the fact that units can freaking move. This will happen all the time in PvT. Terran will just siege up like this. This is great looking pile of tanks, right? If we are in Terran versus Terran, where's the weakness? Oh, all the points. Because I can just siege up three tanks and pick this off. If this is a Terran versus Zerg, where is the weakness? Well, wherever the Marines are. You wind up looking for any stragglers, any good angles. For instance, sometimes if I'm against a, a Terran player who's trying to spread his tanks out a little bit too much, I look at this and I say, you know what? I could probably just pick off these three tanks. The Zerg could retreat everything. And these three are the big vulnerabilities. If you're watching any game, 
I want you to encourage you to slow it down and look at what the shape is, where the stragglers are, where the clumps are. Is it kind of in a bar shape? Is it in a line shape? And think about how that player might repair those or how an opponent might exploit those. This is where your knowledge of unit composition begins to step in. And honestly, one of the things I love so much about looking at micro circumstances is trying to do that analysis really fast all the time throughout a game. That's like so much of Brood War is not sitting back, building up before the whew, big attack. It's kind of darting in, picking the thing off, backing away, moving in, picking off that thing, moving away. We're going to look at specific examples in all the Zerg units, and then an episode of all the Terran units, and then an episode of all the Protoss units, looking at some of those specific micro techniques. Uh, and that's it for today. That's it. That's it. That's it. I'm done. 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 More micro. And then next week, we're going to do Protoss versus Protoss, and the week afterwards, Zerg versus Zerg. Thanks for watching. Let's learn StarCraft, man. I hope you guys learned some shit.